what is it like waking up every day and knowing that and knowing that you are the president of the best country on this planet? As you can see, I have no script. <laughs> so this is coming straight from the heart. I feel so humble staying here in such esteemed company. I can't believe that a little barefooted girl like me from Marleville would ever be in here in such esteemed company. For that, I'm grateful to God. When I became Governor General back in 2018, I was handed a brochure and in that brochure was certain procedure and protocols. One of the protocols was that I don't give speeches. Good evening all, my name is Wendell Daniel and welcome to Street Mike. And today we are coming to you live, live, live and direct from the beautiful, beautiful building here in Tottenham Court Road. And this is the High Commission for a beautiful country called Barbados. Ladies and gentlemen, please sit. We will now have a presentation to Her Excellency by Jade Jordan. Tell me, how do you feel knowing that in a few moments you are going to be presenting such a beautiful bouquet to Her Excellency, the President of Barbados? How does that make you feel? Um. Yeah, it's pretty surreal, to be honest. We will now be addressed by his Excellency, Mr. Milton Innes, High Commissioner for Barbados in the United Kingdom. Your Excellency, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I wish to warmly welcome you to Barbados House this evening, and I wish to especially welcome Her Excellency on her first visit to Barbados House since becoming President of Barbados. Welcome, ma'am. I also wish 
to warmly welcome Ms. Movell Jordan to Barbados House on the occasion of the launch of her book in the UK. And it is a great honor for the High Commission to host you. Cultural diplomacy remains extremely important to Barbados and the High Commission remains committed to hosting events for our creative sector. We look forward to hearing about your journey in writing your book. It only remains for me, therefore, to thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for offering your support to our author, Ms. Movell Jordan, and I hope that you have a wonderful evening. Thank you very much. Excellencies, over the past few years, the Diaspora Unit of the Barbados High Commission in London has received many calls from persons in the diaspora indicating an interest in identifying themselves as Barbados. They express an interest in learning about Barbados. In fact, we have had increased calls for Barbadians, Barbadian citizenship because they want to be part of the Barbadian culture. And therefore, Miss Betty Lewis and I have engaged the young people, young and old, throughout the diaspora, and we are attempting to do so at every level through various media. Last year, we sponsored a season of emancipation with lectures from the, with lectures from the University of the West Indies. We have also had discussions with young professionals in the diaspora. Today, next Tuesday, and on the 13th of July, in order to, for persons to be enjoined in the culture of Barbados, we have book launches. Excellencies, there are many ways to transmit culture, the culture of a people. We can choose from acculturation, interculturation, assimilation, innovation, integration, retention, and erasure. But there's one method that is so often omitted, a method that used to be a part of the Barbadian cultural transmission, but has somehow become less emphatic. And I'm speaking of storytelling. Storytelling and the storyteller have shaped societies. You see, the story of one person tells the struggles of others. And we have today decided to launch these two books by Moval Jordan because in them you discover a very rich part of Barbadian cultural history framed in the parish of St. Philip or the Republic of St. Philip coming second only to the kingdom of St. Peter. <laughs> <laughs> Excellencies, on reading these books, you will discover real culture. I know that you know that I am very reserved, very laid back sometimes, and not one prone to speaking too much. But when I read these books, I see myself in them. And I'm sure that all of you who read these books and knowing about Barbadian culture would know that you will see yourselves in them too. We commend this book to you or these books to you this evening because they're an important part of our history, our culture. And this afternoon, I present to you later the books written by Moville Jordan. And you will hear extracts from them as well. The books are called The Queen of Culpepper and Them Come A Calling. And I will ask Ms. Laurel Hunt to read an extract from Them Come A Calling by Shaquille Newton. I must say that um, I feel very proud to have 
Shaquille O'Hare with me this evening. And he will probably tell you why. <laughs> well, for me, it's just the opportunity to see Bajan culture once again crystallize into mm -hmm. writing. Mm -hmm. And anytime such an um, opportunity arises to do, so, to do so, it's always something to celebrate. Mm -hmm. Your Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, good evening. An extract from them call a them come a calling entitled Bonnie. Bonnie and Rebecca were real, real buddies from primary school. They did everything together, swapped and changed school clothes, wore each other's shoes, everything they would share, everything. If Bonnie had 10 cents, she would give Rebecca five and vice versa. They both attended the same secondary school and though they were not book smart, what they were lacking in academics, they tripled up on in street smarts. They were both smart women when it came to taking care of the ways of life, according to both. After leaving school without a certificate to their names, they did all sorts of odd jobs here and there. Sometimes they would pile canes, kill chicken, pick cotton when in season, clean houses when given the opportunity, or sell fish. Any and every little job they could find, they did it. Because according to Body, nobody ain't knocking she both for the six cents. <laughs> so that kind of independence was formed between those two from day one. Rebecca used to spend every bit of her free time over at Bonnie's aunt's house where Bonnie lived with her aunt Issa. Issa was married to the village drunk, Duncan. Almost every evening, Duncan would come home and give Issa a good cussing, never before involving her sister Rita, who was Bonnie's mother. Sometimes he would say things like, why she don't send for she child from down by me before she start bringing man in here? That is when Ezra would start up, telling Duncan in no uncertain terms what she thought about him. When you get money to build house, you spend two mornings in Canada on contract picking fruit and in work saints. You should thank God for the little government pension that ain't a help to nobody but Miss Barker and shop. She said, if I didn't a church woman, I would have kicked your ass out long time. <laughs> Bonnie hated and could not wait for Auntie Issa to kick his ass out so that Rebecca could come over and live with her. Bonnie always thought of herself the smarter of the two, and even Rebecca thought so too, because it was Bonnie who took her to join the credit union, which helped her to build her little two-bedroom house for her and her two children. It was also Bonnie who took her to the lumber yard, did a little negotiation, and got her some building materials at a special price because she had a friend working there who, according to her, got her his disco. The year before, the sugarcane crop was very good and every day they would make their way up to the plantation yard where they would get on the back of the pickup truck, travel to different cave fields where the men harvesting cans and where the men were harvesting cans and they would pull cans from sunup to sundown. They made quite a few dollars then and it was when Bonnie took Rebecca into Bridgetown to join the credit union. From that day onwards, some of every little bit of money those two got went into the credit union. Bonnie was a very attractive woman and never lacked for male company. That was one of the reasons she had left and went to America. Every woman in the village had it in for Bonnie. They would often accuse her of trying to steal their man. They would drop talk and go out of their way to say nasty things about her, but the men just loved her company. And it was not all about sex. Vonnie fancied herself a counselor and some sort, of some sorts and very wise in the ways of men. She even told Rebecca, had it not for her, a lot of them men would know what to do. One day, <laughs> one day, met, Vonnie met this American man who came over to Barbados for, according to him, some R&R. &R. She was on her way to the credit union to put some money away for Rebecca and herself. Rebecca could not make the trip to town with her because with the two children the two children were at home from school because of this damn lockdown. And Rebecca never left her children with anyone but Vonnie. Rebecca was being very cautious about this new virus going around. Her worst fear was for her children to catch it. Now that the children were attending school every other week in small numbers, she was not able to do very much with them now at home. So often, so often I would our work was slow in coming in so she had to take care of every penny as best as she could. They had four good days the week, 
They had four good days the week before cleaning out some rooms at a hotel where visitors were being quarantined on entering the island and they, the pay was very good. So Vani was on her way to the credit union to put away some on both of their accounts. Vani dressed to the nines that day in a white off the shoulder dress with splashes of green, yellow, blue and red and a matching face. The white material of the dress highlighted the beauty of the darkness of her skin. She always wore her hair natural, and today had it bunched up in a bun on top of her head, with a red scrunchie keeping it in place. Her sweet made the dark beauty of her facial structure very pronounced, and she was indeed very attractive. On her feet, she wore a pair of golden strappy sandals that drew attention to a pair of shapely legs, and what was most outstanding about her, her backside. <laughs> According to the men in the village, it was like a black ass. Her backside drew much attention wherever she went. She knew her assets and she flaunted them and today was no exception. Vonnie stopped at the pedestrian crossing where there were about seven or eight people waiting to cross. She knew she was drawing some attention as it was hard for someone to ignore such a striking figure and she was indeed striking, at least to the handsome American man waiting across the street. He could just not take her his eyes off her. His whole body went into overdrive just by looking at her. It was love, lust, and a whole set of emotions and feelings that were foreign to him. He swore his heart was going to burst through his chest, and he was sure the man standing to his left could hear his heart beating. He was not even aware that the signal for the pedestrian crossing had come on until that striking figure stepped down in front of him and then his heart dropped from his chest. What a backside and moving with such rhythm as though to the beat of some unheard melody. He broke out in cold sweat. Or was it a heat stroke? He wasn't sure what was happening to him, but he, but he had to say something to this woman. He just could not contain himself. These feelings were strong, and there were a wave, and then a wave of excitement came over him. His name was Macchio de Romeo. Thank you. <laughs> I'm sure you would agree with me that at the heart of any aspect of Barbadian culture would be the shrewdness of the females. I, I'm sure you'd agree with me on that. Um, having studied history myself, you would see it at work on the slave plantation. And I've always believed that had it not been for the women, slavery would not have ended the time it ended. So I would understand the shrewdness of the men in the works done by Miss Jordan. I and mean, let me say, <clears throat> that women always know how to deal with adversity. These books were written at a time when Barbados was facing the challenges from the coronavirus. It was also done at a time when the volcanic ash had overtaken Barbados. And Movell used that time of adversity to produce these two books on Barbadian culture. Now we will have an excerpt from The Queen of Cold Pepper to be read by Laurel Hunt. And now my. Is this a change of plans? Who's reading? Oh. From the Coma Calling. This is Tamara Jordan. Good, come to Tamara. Well, I'm very proud to be here. I'm very proud of Mova and what she's accomplished. Um, for years now, I've heard her talking about how she wanted to put her story down. And I've known her now for ooh, over 25 years. And um, and she always has a story to tell. Uh, so it's really good that she's got the chance to put it down on paper. So mm -hmm. I think people will really enjoy reading the books. It's, if you know Moval, you read it and you can, you can hear her. Mm -hmm. I'm reading another extract from further in the book that Shaquille just read from. 
So, the one Frank Clayton had in the village was Alfred. So uh, when Rebecca brought home the thing for Alfred, he didn't waste time in telling Clayton how much of a performance he was putting down these days. So Clayton asked Alfred if he could get him some to try. He was doing so much these days that he could do with the extra help. After Alfred made him promise that he wouldn't tell anyone about it or where he got it from because he didn't want it to reach back to Rebecca's ears, he gave Clayton some of the thing. Clayton was a bragger, and the one thing he always bragged about was his steering powers and how much of a ladies' man he was. That was how he come by these aliases, Ready Set and Dr. Ram. But it was all one big lie. Clayton was failing from a long time ago, and the past few months he was avoiding the few ladies in the village who had helped him build up his reputation as a ladies' man. He knew he could not continue to avoid them far too long, because when things got good with him again, he would not have a friend left. Alfred was his main source of getting this thing. But since the lockdown, and with Alfred not living at Rebecca's house anymore, he told Clayton that his supply was running low, and he couldn't afford to give any of that away. That, plus Clayton did not pay him for the last bit of the thing he brought for him. Clayton was never a man to shy away from anything. He was always an in-your-face sort of person. So he went to Rebecca one day and asked her straight up if she could get some of the thing for him and how he knew she used to buy it for Alfred and so on. Rebecca was angry at first because she knew if there was one person she didn't want in her business, it was Clayton. Clayton was a mason by trade and for some time now, Rebecca was asking him to come and build a little step at the back door for her. And he always promised, but he never turned up. One day, Duncan was on his way home and he was blind drunk. So he stopped by Rebecca to give her a good cussing. He told her that Clayton told everyone in the rum shop that he wouldn't build any step for her because she chased Alfred out of the house. And Alfred is his friend and he wasn't doing any small jobs. He looking for big jobs so she would need to pay him big money. After that, Rebecca really had no good thoughts for Clayton, but then she thought business was business and every customer counts, but she charged Clayton a few dollars more than anyone else. Clayton didn't have a clue that it was a business for Rebecca. He thought she was doing him a favor and he told her how much he appreciated it. He asked her not to let anyone know about their transactions and assured her that he would come at the weekend and build the steps for her. So Rebecca got her steps built free of cost. Clayton figured if he did her this favor, she would help keep his secret for him. Nonetheless, Rebecca knew the importance of keeping the customers happy in this business. She knew discretion was key, but she had no intention of giving him that assurance. Not to mention, she wanted some more work done around the house soon, so she figured the best place she could keep Clayton was where she had him, at her beck and call. Now, Clayton was one of her best customers, so whatever little there was to be sold, it was going between Clayton and Pastor Nigel Moore. Clayton was back in the game. Now that he was getting his own supply of the thing from Rebecca, he was in top form. Clayton had some unfinished business with Chantel. He was making a play for it, but he had run out of the thing. And that is when he ran into Pastor Nigel Moore that night. He had just gone to collect his thing because Rebecca told him not much was left, but she expected some soon. But he could not afford to take any chances. He had to get hold of what little he could. So he went a calling at Rebecca's house. Clayton was surprised to see Pastor Nigel Moore on Rebecca's doorstep that time of evening, but Chantal had told him she saw him coming out of Rebecca's house before, and how she heard that Pastor Nigel Moore was trying to save Rebecca's soul. This whole thing had Clayton thinking, is Pastor Nigel Moore trying to save Rebecca's soul, or was he a wolf in sheep's clothing, or in this case a wolf in the claw? Is Pastor Nigel Moore going to buy the same thing as him? Even so, why would he be buying the thing? Is the goodly pastor having problems? 
The last time Clayton set foot in church was almost four years ago. And he believed that everything Pastor Nigel Moore said that Sunday was directed to him. So he never went back. That Sunday, Pastor Nigel Moore came down the aisle and stood next to him, thumping his Bible in, his, in the palm of his hand and looked him straight in the eyes. He talked about Judas Iscariot, about Barabbas, about the foolish man building his house upon the sand. The last thing he recalled was Pastor Nigel Moore looking him in his eyes and saying, Thou hypocrite, remove the beam from your eye. Then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the more out of thy brother's eye. He was afraid of Pastor Nigel Moore. He was afraid of God. And as far as he was concerned, Pastor Nigel Moore saw down into his soul that Sunday. And he wasn't going back. He always made sure their paths never crossed. He'd make sure to stay clear out of the good pastor's way. So that night, when he was leaving Rebecca's house and saw Pastor Nigel Moore come a calling, he was overcome with that feeling of fear again, the same one he experienced that Sunday morning. Thank God he had built those steps for Rebecca. When he saw the good pastor standing there, he wanted to get out of his way as quickly as possible. And without something solid to plant his feet on, he would have fallen down right there in front of the pastor. Then there was that biblical quote he let loose on him before he could get away. I would lift up my eyes onto the hills from whence cometh my help. Clayton was thinking about that all along. Had Rebecca told Pastor Nigel more his secret that he was coming for, to her for help? Was she doing that confession thing? Is that the reason why the pastor came calling? Or was the pastor coming to buy the thing? And was using his Bible thumping ways as a blind. Clayton was now curious. He had to find out one way or the other if Pastor Nigel Moore was buying the thing. <coughs> Clayton wanted to know. He wanted to know if the goodly pastor was having problems fulfilling his marital duties and was seeking the same help as him. If Pastor Nigel Moore has experienced these manly problems, surely that makes him human and he should be less afraid of him. After all, their problems were the same. But if he was going to hear Rebecca's sinful confessions and try to save her soul, then Clayton was in big trouble. So he had to find out to put his mind at rest. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I want to, est I want to establish one thing with you. The pastor, Nigel Moore in that book is not a pseudonym for me. <laughs> not me. <laughs> you know, storytelling has always been a tradition in Barbados. And very often it was used to tell a moral, it was a moral teaching. And Parents and grandparents would always have stories to tell their children. And it was always very clear in, in their presentation. Now, if something happened, if, in fact, if you had to get a story told to you or get a good talking to, because that's how the stories used to come out, if you had to get a good talking to, what they would do is put you to sit, and you would have heard that story about 12 times already, but you had to pretend that you were hearing it for the first time. And you had to hope that what happened, happened about 9 o'clock in the morning. Because it if it happened at 5 o'clock in the afternoon, then you will hear, I remember I got up that morning around 6.30. It was 6.30 or a quarter. I think it between 6.30 and a quarter to 7. And then I had a cup of tea. I wasn't sure if it was Milo tea, cocoa tea, coffee tea, or green tea. And you would hear everything that happened between when that um, person got up and when the accident or whatever it is took place. So the point is that you had a full story. And sometimes we tell stories and we go and we talk immediately about what happened. But you don't create the scene. Stories created the scene. Stories told the story, the history, and the culture of a, of a people. And so, Movel Jordan has put her stories in two books. 
I met Movin years ago in St. Philip because in those days, St. Catherine's Church in St. Philip could not exist without a good priest from St. Peter. <laughs> so I met her then, and ever since then we became friends. And um, I would say, I can tell you that she can cook very good. As a matter of fact, let me put it this way. Her culinary habits satiate our delectation and guzzlement so that we quiver for more. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Miss Movel Jordan. So I'm here to promote the books and to share in the culture. One of the books is discussing the culture, how we were brought up, and I think everyone is dying to hear and to see the book. So I'm here to share this special moment with my fellow Barbadians and West Indians. How great was it for you to receive that invitation to come over to promote your book? I felt on top of the world. It was unbelievable. I, I, it's part of my dream coming true. I never envisioned seeing me in a setting such as this. Mm. But Your Excellency, the Most Honorable Dame Sandra Mason, President of Barbados, His Excellency Milton Innes, High Commissioner to the UK, Reverend Charles Morris, Deputy High Commissioner and Mrs. Morris, specially invited guests, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. As you can see, I have no script, so this is coming straight from the heart. I feel so humble staying here in such esteemed company. I can't believe that a little barefooted girl like me from Marleville would ever be staying here in such esteemed company. For that, I'm grateful to God. It gives me great pleasure to look around this room and see so much of you from the best side of Barbados, and that's the East. <laughs> and that gives me great pleasure. What gives me double pleasure to look just ahead of me and see one of my favorite people who's here to share this special moment with me, none other than Her Excellency, President of Barbados, Dame Sandra Mason. And I must say to you, I feel really heartfelt emotional to see at 64 years old, I can stay here and there's my son, his wife, and my granddaughter. And I am staying here feeling so proud and nervous. And I can try to say a few words to them. You were the driving force behind the publication of my books. You were the encouragement, and I love you all so much. Jason, I want to tell you, without your encouragement, I wouldn't have get it done. I didn't believe I could get it done. And then with the um, encouragement, and I must say constant, from Her Excellency, she's beginning to make me think that I'm all that in writing, and I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for that. And I thank you so much for all the support and encouragement you two have given me. 
Mr. High Commissioner, I want to thank you, the deputy, and the staff of the commission for welcoming me here today. And I want to say thank you all very much. To all the Philippines and the invited guests here today, I feel so blessed. I'm so grateful that you all travel all these miles to come and see me. But I know deep inside, um, it wasn't only me. You came to see your beloved president from your neck of the woods. And I won't hold it against you because I love seeing her too. <laughs> to the Mr. over there, Lindell, I want to say thanks. Lindell is streaming this live for us because he too wanted to be part of this because he wanted to be here with the president and the high commissioner. So he said he will do this for Philippines. He's from Carrington Village. I want, <laughs> I want to say a really special thank you for the Deputy High Commissioner for his invitation here and to his lovely staff, Betty, and those who I'm just beginning to learn their names for making me feel so welcome and for helping the commissioner and the deputy commissioner hold this event. I just want to say I am grateful and I want to thank you all for coming this evening. Thank you all very much. We now have one more excerpt to, to be read from the book and be read by Lord Hunt. Your Excellency, Most Honorable Dame Sandra Mason, President of Barbados. His Excellency, Milton Innes, High Commissioner, Deputy High Commissioner, Reverend Charles Morris. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. I'll be reading from Mobile's Pride the Queen of Culpeper. And first, I will set the scene. I'll be reading from chapter 10, but I'll set the scene by reading two paragraphs from chapter 1. Queen Elizabeth was the head of England, and Errol Barrow was in charge of Barbados. That much we knew. And there was Culpeper Island. No inhabitants, no ruler. I wanted to be queen of Culpeper. Growing up in Marleyvale, the last child of my mother's 11 children, I wanted to make a difference. I wanted to make my mother proud. I wanted to make her happy. I wanted her to have nice things. We were very poor and every day you could see her struggling to make ends meet. Mother was an expert clothes presser. Pressing being the, the Bajan colloquialism for ironing. So she would make a few extra dollars washing and ironing khaki pants for a few of the men in the village. It was said that when Violet, my mother's first name, put in a four seam in a pants that when the pants mash up, it does still got in the seam. She was that good. Most housewives would make their own starch and mother would let us grate the cassava. There were two types of cassava. The one for making starch and cassava flour was called the poison cassava, and the one for cooking was called the cooking cassava. There were also two types of crocus bags, a fine bag and a coarse bag, with the coarse bags having bigger holes and of a coarse material, hence the name, and conversely, the fine bag had small holes and was of a softer material. 
we would grater the poison cassava in the wash tub and mother would add a bit of water to it and place it on the old ottoman. Then she would gather her enamel basin and the coarse bag and put it next to the wash tub before placing her dung basket on the floor. She would hold one, of, one end of the crocus bag under her arm and I would hold the other end. I would always volunteer to help because I loved seeing the patterns that the bag made with the cassava. Then she would use an enamel bowl to pour the grated cassava onto the bag, holding it over the basin. No matter how many times we did this together, her words to me were always the same. Try and hold it tight. Don't let go. You twist that side and I can twist the next. It was like a dance we were performing and I loved it. I was the youngest, so she thought I should try and learn something about the place. So whenever she was doing the cassava, I was called upon to do the ringing. But as I said, I loved to see the patterns. As we twisted the bag with the grated cassava, the liquid would fall into the basin and she would place the rung out cassava in the dung basket. And I thought it was beautiful, like a fine piece of artwork. The cassava re resembled giant swirls of vanilla ice cream with the pattern from the coarse bag making diamond-like shapes all over it. When all that was finished, she would put the cassava in the down basket out to dry. And she would then leave the liquid in the basin for a little while to coagulate. In a few days, there would be a basin of solid starch. It was a fascinating process. And when the cassava dried, some of the others would join in rubbing it between our hands to turn it into flour. That starch and cassava flour would be given out to some of the neighbors. I dreaded when mother had an abundance of starch. I think we all did. That starch would be put in every piece of clothing to be ironed. <laughs> and what we dreaded most was when she put it in our cloth panties. <laughs> the puff like panties for school would be stiff, stiff when starched and ironed. And I swear they also had a foreseen. I had two cloth panties for church, a pink one and a yellow one. And if I wear the pink one this Sunday, next Sunday it will be the yellow, and so on. So every other Sunday, it would be pink or yellow, and those two church panties would be given extra starch so that they would be so stiff that the sides of them would flare off like a skirt. The bottom of the legs of these two church panties were trimmed with a thin strip of lace and the lace will be real stiff and even had a sharp edge to it from the start. Walking to church and back with a starch and iron. <laughs> Sorry. Walking to church and back with a starch and iron panty on and wearing a a pair of black patent leather tight shoes with sheer torture. <laughs> Sometimes there would be slight abrasions on my inner thighs, but never at the side legs because the sides were properly flared. One Monday morning, because of some discomfort, I took my panties off at school and had them in my uniform pocket and my pockets were puff out big. My sister asked me, what are you going in your pocket? <laughs> <laughs> Do 
knowing I was only supposed to have my handkerchief in there and it was puffed out too big, she knew something else had to be in there. She grabbed hold of me before I could answer and hand down in my pocket and out came my panties. What are you doing with your panty off? Put these back on now. You're an idiot or what, she said. These got up between me foot sore, I said. Put these back on now or when we get home, I can tell mother. So I had to put them back on. No sooner did we land in the yard did she tell mother. Mother, she took off she panty at school and had it in she pocket. Well, mother said, go and bring that coconut broom here. <laughs> and mother grabbed hold of my uniform and my sister ran and went for the coconut broom. And I will never forget those four hot lashes I got. You, walking about the place, with out a party on and all the air blowing up your parts. I never took those stiff starch and iron panties off again. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. <laughs> those are just a few excerpts from the books written by Morville Jordan. You know, as I'm sure that you can see the, the real culture in Barbados, what used to really happen in Barbados in those days. But there were stories, but they were true. And the thing is that we learned from them. And the idea was not to make the same mistake. Somehow, children always made the same mistake over and over. But as we go on, I believe that the time will come when we will have an overflowing or a call for more stories because somehow we are losing the script. And I believe that we need to spread our culture. We need not, we need not adapt someone else's culture because in Barbados, I'm talking about Barbados alone, we have a richness of culture that other people crave. And I'm sure that most of you understood some of the terms that, were, that are used in these books. I'm sure you, you all do understand. I hope you buy the books because there's another story in there, um, the one where she killed the, the, the it was a turkey? The chicken. Well, oh, you read it too, High Commissioner. <laughs> so you see, I'm, I'm telling the truth. The, 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 she killed the chicken, or thought they killed the chicken, and cut, or thought they cut the chicken's neck. And I, I, I want to buy the book. The bill. Good. Her Ashley says, if you want to know more about the chicken, buy the book. <laughs> so we look forward to you to you um, purchase the book and at the same time to assist in spreading the Barbarian culture here in the United Kingdom. And now we are going to have some presentations. And the first one will be made to the High Commissioner. Yes, sir, you. <laughs> <coughs>
The next presentation will be to the, the Deputy High Commissioner. <laughs> <laughs> Movell has a new friend, and she wants to make a special presentation to him. And that new friend, sir, is you, Mr. Wendell Daniel. and the love that we Barbadians show wherever we go for each other. Peace and love. Could I maybe thank everyone for giving me this opportunity to be here today? It has been a, it has been a wonderful experience for me. I get the opportunity to do so many great things as a live streamer all around London. I do many things on most days, but one thing that's really important for me is to, you know, when I was asked if I would do this, I just jumped at the opportunity. Am I available on the 1st of June? Yes. Am I available at six o'clock? Yes. And for me, it's about giving something back to my country, to my people. And it is great to be able to do so. And it's not about money. I wasn't interested in nothing like that. It's just about giving something back. And to be here with so many great people, to be here with the president as well, for me, it's one of the most, most amazing things I've done. And all I can say is thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. And it was brilliant. Morvel just told me she has a presentation to make to a special friend. Um, apparently this person don't think or don't know that they are my special friend. Yeah. Miss Lauren, this is for you. <laughs> 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 She's ready to see. Oh, this is for you. On behalf of me and my family. Thanks for having us. <laughs> Um, Mr. High Commissioner, let me tell you that I'm glad that this has happened because I was number two in the house and then Movel came and he moved down to number three. His wife came, I'm down to number four. The daughter is here and I'm down to number five. But at least I'm ahead of somebody now, Jason. <laughs> Thank you so very much. And now we have a presentation to be made to Morville herself on behalf of all the young people in the United Kingdom. No. Oh, no, I'm Come. <laughs> Madam President, High Commissioner Ines, Deputy High Commissioner, Mr. Jordan, Andy Mavell. <laughs> this is on behalf of the second and third Barbadian generations to say thank you for what you've done, for your mark in history, and for taking the step with the support of your family to make something monumental with your books. I pray that God will continue to bless your hands. I pray that God will continue to bless your mind. And I look forward to many, many more. So on behalf of all of us, we love you, we appreciate you. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Um, this
this is indeed a surprise. I never thought that the third and fourth generation of Barbados would recognize me in such a beautiful way, not only with flowers, but with words. And I do appreciate it. Thank you so very much. Ladies and gentlemen, we are coming to the end of the, this part of the evening. And we want to thank you very much for coming here. As Mova said, you really didn't come to hear me. You didn't come to hear her. All you came to do was to buy her books, but really you all wanted to hear somebody else. And, <clears throat> but we want to thank you for taking the time out to come to this session this afternoon. We know that the streets are very busy, given the fact that this is the weekend for the celebration, the, is the platinum celebration of Her Majesty. And this is the evening too when we have the Queen of Culpeper here. So thank you all very much. I want to thank especially the, we have two legal luminaries here that I know of. Um, Miss I. Stephanie Boyce, who is the president of the British and Wales Law Society. <laughs> Stephanie. <laughs> and I must say, I think that she is the first black or first female? Both. Both. She is the first female and the first black president of the British and Wales Law Society, and she would want me to say to you that she's not just a Barbarian, she is a Bajan. <laughs> Her brother is also the technical director for the Barbados football team, and we really appreciate all of the giving back that you've done. We also have uh, Miss Jackie Devnish, who is now assisting us in Barbados with an app. And we want to thank you, Jackie, for your work that you are putting and that you will put in and for being here this evening. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, you wouldn't hear from me again, but I'm sure there are many of you waiting. Madam President, your people. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Now, um, I should tell you that when I became Governor General back in 2018, I was handed a brochure and in that brochure was certain procedure and protocols. One of the protocols was that I don't give speeches. However, I have been quite faithful to that protocol. But as you would know, as Bajans and semi Bajans and want to be Bajans and forever Bajans, <laughs> we tend to step aside and break pr protocols and break rules. And there are always certain occasions that you cannot get away from breaking a rule. And this is one of them. This is one of them. That is the reason why I followed Rubel to London. <laughs> well, she talked to you about all the support and everything that I gave her. But she is one of the few people, I tell you, that I admire in Barbados. And there are a lot of people, oh, this person is my hero, I admire this person. But Movell is one I admire. I know Movell and have known Movell from the time she was born. She told you she is 64 years old. I am 73. 
And as a consequence, she was born sort of obliquely across from me in East Point. And because of the age difference, I would have to know her. We didn't really go to school together because, you know, in a school term, in a school year, in a school life rather, nine years is a lot. When you are entering, somebody who's nine years older than you would be leaving. Such would be the, the situation with Movell. But I have known her all her life. She can't say the same thing for me though. And um, as a consequence, I have known everything about her. The good, the bad, and the otherwise. And I will not regale you with that this evening. However, the good that I will tell you though is that she is not ashamed from whence she came. And that is one of the problems with some of us. For you fourth generation Bajans, you would not know the word or the phrase poor great. But a lot of us in Barbados, we were born poor. We became great because we've always thought of ourselves as great. But poor great doesn't mean that. Poor great is a different thing. And for the ones who have um, ancestors, have uh, family, you can find out what poor great is. But we were not poor great in that sense. We were poor great in the sense that we knew that we would reach the heights. And one of the re other reasons why I admire Movell is the fact of those two books. I don't care, I could never sit down to write the books that she's written. And you should all read them, because although they're supposed to be stories, I will tell you, we lived in East Point in Marley Vale, and I can recognize the people that she's talking about. <laughs> they are people from our districts. For some of you, the Bajans, the Philippines, and I shall stop here to tell the goodly pastor that I know one of the sins, one of the deadly sins is envy. And being envious of St. Philip is not <laughs> going to get anybody anywhere. <laughs> and as Movell alluded to, regardless of what you do, the wise men came from the East and we cannot <laughs> rewrite the Bible. <laughs> Nevertheless, as I was saying, I don't think that I have the ability to sit and write the books that she has. Um, they are, there are stories in there that for some of you, you can ask your family if they recognize the people, but they're true stories. Um, and I have said to her, while them come a calling is a story in itself that cannot be prolonged, she has to complete the story about Queen of Culpeper because it came to an end that I told her I did not like um, and there is so much more to be said. And there is in fact a Culpeper for those of you who do not know. Because Culpeper is in the East, they did not do what they did with Pelican. They could not make St. Philip any bigger. And that is why we still have our island, Culpeper, in St. Philip. They joined Pelican onto, into St. Michael and made it the water, har the water harbor and everything. But we still have our Culpeper. And every picture that I get of Culpeper, I give it to Movell because that is her kingdom. Anyway, um, it gives me real serious good pleasure. That's one of the reasons why I followed Movell to London. Um, the other is because it gives me the opportunity to meet and greet, especially the ones from St. Philip, and the ones more especially from East Point and Marley Vale. Some of you might only know me because of my name, but some of you would know me probably as a young girl growing up. But it really gives me great pleasure to be here, to see all of you. The last time I was here would have been 2018. Yes, yes 2018, and I came. And because of COVID, I was unable, like Novel, to write books, but I um, am able, I'm able now to return to London, one of my favorite places. 
So thank you for having me. Uh, I am happy to be here. And as was said and has been said, you have to buy the books. And if I want to count the number of persons in here this evening, I expect each of you to go home with those two books. And if you have, if she doesn't have enough, you can order them. I am not her salesperson, yeah, but um, <laughs> the books make really, really good reading, I tell you. And for those of you who don't know about village life in Barbados, it will give you an opportunity. And I know Reverend Morris spoke about one of our shortcomings, that we do not tell our stories. And um, as I go around meeting centenarians, that is something that I always say, because they have so many stories to tell. And especially things like the, um, I'm going to stop now, I promise. Um, and especially things like, we call it the riots, but the 1937 um, revolution that we had in Barbados. They are the ones to tell you the true stories. The historians give you the watered down version but the, um, the centenarians, and a lot of them are very lucid and are able to interact and they can tell you these stories. I had a visit the other day from a Mr. Brayton, I don't know if you know him, but he is in full possession of all his faculties and he was also able to give me a story about the 1937 uprising. And that is one of our uh, misfortunes in Barbados that we do not take advantage of our own people who tell us the stories and who know the true stories and not the watered down or the handed over versions. But again, thank you very much for having me and it is a pleasure for me to be here. High Commissioner, thank you, and Deputy, and Nat Lee, and everybody else. Buy the books, thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, we will now have some refreshments and the books will be here shortly for you to purchase. Just let me say there's, there's a group of persons from St. Philip, Madam, a group of persons from St. Philip, the organization, they have a little book called Love and Devotion and they themselves have devoted themselves to giving back to Barbados. You will see them with their t-shirts and they, they want to give, make collections to give to the schools in Barbados. And they are from St. Philip. Thank you all very much. Like to be the president. Oh, what it's like to be the president? Yes, I want that, to but, find out too. <laughs> but take your pictures and then I can ask you. Yes. But you can't ask me that question. Can I ask you now? No, you can't ask me what it's like to be the president because I wake up with me. Yeah, I wake up with me every morning. And, and I don't know, you know, I, I'm not aware when I wake up uh -huh. as the president. It's mm -hmm. only as I go along during the day mm -hmm. that. I have certain duties to perform, and then I say to myself, yeah, I'm the president. Mm. But I do not wake up being the president, so I cannot ask you um, what it is like to be the president. Um, Martin, I'll, re I'll rephrase the question. What is it like waking up every day and knowing that, and knowing that you are the president of the best country on this planet? I cannot check for you, but the other part of what it like to me, I cannot answer, you know, I, I really don't know, because I am me, and I, I have been me for 73 years, and I don't know what it's like to be the president, I know what it's like to be you, and you know that part of it, but seriously though, um, I became Governor General of Mm -hmm. And you know, when, when asked to do that 
do it. I didn't know it. I, I kind of had an idea what the duty entailed. Mm -hmm. All right? And because um, I what I've done, I acted for three days in 2012. And um, during those three days, I did a number of things. At that time, I wasn't aware mm -hmm. what part of the duty in general. I, like most um, persons thought that it was purely ceremonial. I'm going to ask you the obvious question. What is a Deputy High Commissioner? High Commissioner? Well, I'm mainly responsible for diaspora affairs. Mm -hmm. um, all, the, all the coordinating matters between the diaspora and the Barbados High Commission. Um, looking after the concerns of the Barbados in the diaspora. And to be quite honest, we've been having quite a few concerns recently. But we are, we are working in the interest of Barbados here. Mm -hmm. Big up Street Mike. Big up Street Mike, long time, long time. <laughs> Big up Street Mike. Give him the thumbs up, like, comment, share. And also click the notification bell so when he goes live, you will be able to be there. Keep on doing the great work, you're creating awareness. You're Big, Big up Street Mike. Big up Street Mike. Click your notification bell.